Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Gillian. How are you today? I'm really great. Thank you, Michael. How are you? I'm really brilliant. Thank you. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on probably how you ma- how I got to invite you to come on the podcast. Um, so we'll talk about the linkage perhaps a little bit later on. But um, yeah, I haven't interviewed that many guests during this kind of COVID crisis that we're all in around the globe. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time out, which I'm sure is a really busy time at the moment. Mm. Um, even if you haven't got anything to do, it's still busy. And um, so I appreciate you taking a few minutes out to come and chat with me. Um, I'm going to start with the same question I ask every single guest that come on the podcast. And that is, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so where were you born? Have you moved around the country? A little bit about your education. And then we'll transition into your kind of work career Mm -hmm. and I will just interject when I hear something interesting I may interrupt you ask you to expand on something so over to you Gillian yeah sounds perfect and thank you it's a pleasure to be here Um, so I was born in Scotland in uh, Tayside so Dundee Mindwell's hospital Um, and I was actually adopted as a baby so I went to my parents, who I know as my parents, for when I was uh, three weeks old, I think. Um, And I was brought up on a farm in the county of Angus, which is the east of Scotland, for those that don't know it, between Dundee and Aberdeen. Um, So all of my childhood in the outdoors, on the farm, uh, developed a real passion for the food production and how things were got from the fields to our plates. yeah and uh, my so my first jobs were on the back of the potato harvester and picking berries and uh, all that kind of thing so that got a real passion around how things were made amazing yeah and um i so i went to school in dundee and when i finished there i went to study manufacturing engineering at strathclyde university in glasgow so mm-hmm. kind of furthering that uh knowledge about how things get onto our plate um so that was uh five years in glasgow a big transition for me moving from being the country girl uh, into the right in the center of glasgow um at the age of 17 but i i really loved it um met some great friends there that i'm still very close to um many years later <laughs> um, and uh, it, that, that uh, degree was at manufacturing sciences and engineering really set me up well. Mm. Um, I started working in manufacturing so I worked for Diageo the drinks company yeah. in one of the whiskey bottling plants in Glasgow right. as a, a maintenance engineer and uh, did my final year project with them and a little bit of work afterwards for them. But then I moved down to the uh, southeast of England to work for Mars, the confectionery company. Right. And I joined them on their graduate development program based in Basingstoke initially. I know it well, Uh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So I was in Basingstoke for a year in the drinks factory. Um, And Mars is a company that really values breadth in its leaders. So I was on their management development program. And they would do things like move the sales director into HR and the HR director would go and do operations and the marketing director would go and do sales and the finance director would go and do something else. And for them, it was much less about the particular experience that Mm. you have and much more about your leadership ability and if you've got a strong team underneath you so they they use that approach for their graduate development program as well yeah so i had some time in manufacturing and then i had some time in hr uh, and some marketing in between but i ended up uh, really enjoying hr and had my first hr role which was quite a baptism of fire um, where i was looking after hr for one of the confectionery factories in slough 
um, happened to be the one where Twix was made. So that, that was always a bit of a temptation. <laughs> Fresh, <laughs> freshly baked biscuit off the line. Um, wow. Smelt amazing. Um, but there I really, I, it's one of these things you don't really realize until you look back how good a grounding um, those roles I had at Mars were. So mm. lots of responsibility really early on, lots of autonomy, um, given leadership responsibility. When I was at 21, I was leading a team in the, um, in the warehouse, um, kind of just thrown in at the deep end. Um, mm. And sometimes given the, often given the support to do that as well, but it was quite scary <laughs> often that, imagine, that you're being yeah. given that, that amount of responsibility so early on in your career mm. and still very green and like, who's this young graduate come in and tell it and, and, and you make mistakes as a new leader. Um, so I, I learned some things the hard way about great leadership and not so great leadership as well. It's incredible that they trusted their young leaders to take such you know, early responsible roles. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah. And it's, and I think that's one of the reasons that if you look around, particularly British industry, there are a lot of ex Martians uh, leading British industry at the moment. And I do think part of it is down uh, to that, that group. Right, 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 um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Sounds good. Yeah. So that challenged you significantly, I would have thought. Certainly did. It certainly did. So like I say, my first leadership experiences, um, my first experience of, of really dealing with difficult issues. So mm. in that the HR role that I had, I had a death in service um, and having to deal with that type of thing for the first yeah. time. Um, lots of, um, I guess, employee relations challenges. Mm. So where the factory was is a very ethnically diverse area and so mm. there was also some challenges uh around uh i guess how how people interact with each other and, and yeah. some of the challenges we're still seeing in the world today um unfortunately and um it's it really did as hard as it was at the time looking back now i see just how much i learned from those experiences and, mm. and how they shaped me as a leader and, and as an individual as well um and there was always there were always people there with experience to ask and and to get support from when you when you needed it. And and did you then stay in HR then? In yeah, yeah. So I really enjoyed HR, and what I did was I kind of moved between the the role that I had my first HR role, which is what I'd call a business facing HR role. So you're working with a business team with the managing director or business director and their leadership team um, yeah. to implement the strategy within that business. I moved between those types of roles and center of excellence roles. So right. around learning and development and talent management um, and engagement. And I tended to, through my career, I flicked between the two. And actually, I always felt it made me better. Each time I moved, I felt like I was better because you go from being uh, business facing and you're really close to what the real issues are on the ground mm. to then a center of expertise where you're getting much more into that thought leadership space. Yeah. But you've got that grounding of knowing actually oh, this, this sounds great, but is it really practical on the front line mm. and, vice, and vice versa? So I've always found myself switching between those types of roles. Um, I stayed at Mars for a number of years and then I joined uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, right. In 2007, so just before the credit crunch. Oh, um, wow. Did yeah. you move back then? Uh, no, so actually I was working uh, in the Global Banking and Markets Division, which is in the city of London. Oh, wow. So um, by that point, I was living in Twickenham. Um, right. Yeah, which is a lovely part of the world to live in, um, mm. even if you are a Scot. <laughs> 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 and uh, um, yeah, I so I worked joined uh, in 2007 and I was um, looking after talent and engagement uh, for global banking and markets mm. um, and that was all great for about probably just less than a year I would say when the credit crunch uh, started to impact mm. um, and so I was I moved into a business facing role but basically spent a year making 
making people redundant. Um, oh, and it was obviously a, a difficult time with it was the um, Fred era and um, lots of redundancies all over the industry. Yeah. The bank, uh, being bailed out by the government and mm. banking wasn't the, in, it was the first time in my life where you maybe didn't feel quite so proud to say where you worked for when somebody no. asked you, which was no. interesting. It was also, I would say, it's the first time my values were really tested at work um, because having made redundancies whilst I was at Mars, I'd seen yes. it done in a way where people were really treated with respect and dignity and, and all across the banking sector that I don't feel personally that that was really happening at that time. No. Um, and so it didn't sit well with me how how we were making people redundant. And um, so I, I moved fairly quickly, looked for another role. Um, but it was, like I say, it was the first time my values were really tested. And it, made, it was the first time I recognized actually how important that is if you're in an organization that there is that mismatch in culture and what's, what is and what isn't deemed kind of acceptable behavior and things like that. And do, do you think partially that's because i mean the banking industry i mean my father was in banking mm -hmm. right i never and both my brothers ended up in banking i never wanted to go into banking <laughs> um and do you think that part of the kind of values mismatch in the organization was because the banking industry had never seen anything like it ever and this was the first time that a crisis had to test the management that probably never had to face this before. Hmm. I mean, so maybe to a certain extent, so I would say coming from a manufacturing background in manufacturing, even if it's not a crisis time, you are constantly looking at ways to be more productive, ways to improve the line efficiency, ways to be able to make something as high quality for less. Um, so you, you constantly have that continuous improvement um, and you don't just throw money thing, at things and, and stuff That's like that. That's right. So, yeah. Um, a number of industries don't have that. And banking, I would say, is one of them. So they weren't used to this mindset of, I guess you would call it lean mindset, where you're trying yes. to, yeah. Um, so I would say that was new. Mm -hmm. However, I would also say, and I'm not just tarring RBS with this brush because I think it happens across the, the industry. I think mm -hmm. there are ways that you can do things that still leave people feeling that they have been treated with dignity and respect. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and having said that, I think the, so you had managers making people redundant that have never had to do this in their lives before. That's right. And I've seen it subsequently working in the oil industry as well, that mm. um, we expect people to have these difficult conversations mm. um, that uh, are life changing for people. Um, and we don't give them any support in how to have the conversation. We might give them a script that they have to read um, mm. and, uh, and they might get, they'll get the process stuff. But very rarely do they get, and, and I have worked with a few companies in the oil industry subsequently who have invested in training for their line managers to be able to have conversations with empathy and, and things right. like that. But very rarely do they do that because at a time of cutting costs, the training budget is the first thing to go. And so all these managers that have never done it before are thrown in at the deep end and don't really know how to do, are really uncomfortable with it and mm. therefore just muddle through. And if yes. you're on an individual on the receiving end of that, that does not feel great. Um, and well, the, it's really interesting what you say because I was in manufacturing as well for a very long time, for 28 years mm. in the textile industry. And although I didn't have shop floor facing roles, I was more on the sales and marketing end of it. Mm. Um, inevitably, you get involved in many, many different aspects of it, especially when you get more senior in organizations and, you know, the kind of lean mentality and all of that. But the textile industry and the textile industry, of course, was a dwindling industry in the UK because everything was going offshore. Yeah. So the amount of redundancies that had to be made. And I remember 
like you, I got leadership roles at a very, very young age. And um, there was an American guy who worked for one of the American companies I worked for. And he was quite elderly, but he was like one of these consultants, troubleshooter, traveled the world to all the different manufacturing plants. And he turned around to me and he said, you need to get ready for being able to make people redundant. And I did not believe him. You know, I went, well, that's a strange thing to say. I mean, these were the days when you just didn't hear people getting made redundant. Yeah, it just jobs didn't for life. Happen. Yeah, jobs <laughs> for life. Yeah. And, and then it happened. And basically, the rest of my career, I spent time doing that, you know. And you're right, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do for anybody. And I mean, it's quite topical, we're talking about it now, because we're about to go into another period yeah. of organizations having to make people redundant for the next, I don't know how long, Who knows? Yeah. few years mm. coming. Um, and there are so many management out there that I just haven't got a clue. Yeah. And it's not even so obviously there's a side that you, you want generally, I think most people want to treat others with respect and to, yes. to treat them well. I think there's a piece that on one hand, managers don't have the tools and the support and the capability often to be able to have those conversations with skill and with empathy. Yes. Um, but that's something that can be learned <laughs> if, if organizations are willing to invest in it. 100%. Um, and on the other hand, you've got a world now where I imagine where you're making redundancies in the textile industry was before the days of the internet, Twitter, mm. whatever. Mm. Um, these days, if someone feels treated badly, it can mm. be all over the internet in a matter of minutes and gone viral. Yes. Um, and so you have this kind of dichotomy of this potential huge reputational impact as an organization if you don't handle it well yes. and these scores of managers who you're not supporting to handle it well um other than give them a script which makes people feel like part of a process rather than human beings yeah um, and you know i only think it's luck that we haven't had more instances of organizations having really horrendous reputational damage um as a result of not treating people well through difficult times yeah. And we've heard and, some of them just over the last six months. I mean, there's, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I certainly remember reading stories about organizations that maybe hadn't been treating their people well at mm. the start before we had the furlough scheme and things like that. So, mm. Well, the whole, th the whole thing is, I'm, I'm trying to be empathetic with management as well, because mm. it's a case of, you know, some companies are just going into receivership, right? They're yes. kind of going... We're having to close down and it happens like that well it never does yeah that there's warnings right there's warning signs they were probably teetering on the brink before we went into this situation with covid yeah. and now it means they can't survive through yeah. this period which is totally understandable and then when they go well you can't treat people with empathy when you kind of go, well, it's a mass closure. Sorry, can't do anything else about it. You're going to get the standard letter like everyone else is getting in the whole mm -hmm. organization. And now it's up to the receiver to, you know, bleed the company for as much as it can and see if people, yeah. And then it becomes so sorry, impersonal. Just, do you not yeah. think that, regardless of the situation, somebody that's being made redundant merits a conversation, even if it's just a five minute conversation. Yeah, it's a really good challenge. And I would like to think, I would like to hope that people think that way. Mm. Unfortunately, they just do not. Exactly. They don't, they don't think that way. And we'll talk about it later in terms of what mm. you're doing today, mm. but um, that, it, there is a mentality and I remember being being a manager in an organization I used to get oh what would these magazines management magazines used to come out every month and I yeah. used to read it and they talked about this issue in the UK I mean this must be a long time ago now this is like quarter of a century ago I would yeah. say they were talking about that the UK lacks management skill 
in rounded managers who are able to deal with these difficult situations. Mm. Uh, I know we're going off on a tangent, so. No, but it's an interesting tangent because it's actually, it's, it opens up the door to one of my other hobby horses. <laughs> 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 oh, oops, I'm falling off my um, wobbly chair here. Um, right. Which is uh, that we often put people into leadership positions because they are very good at what they do. They're technical yes. experts or they're functional experts, whether that's mm. in something like engineering or whether it's something like accountancy or law. They've mm. become very good at what they do. And because, and that might be because of the organization structure or what you're able to pay and restrictions around that, because mm. there isn't a way to pay them more or to show them recognition in a functional or technical way, we promote them into leadership roles, regardless of whether yes. they've got any leadership skill whatsoever. And that is a challenge that is um, a real hobby horse of, of mm. mine. Um, mm. And I, I work a lot now with organizations and with individuals who come from that technical and functional background, but are now in leadership roles and want to be able to know how to have those tough conversations, how to um, deal with difficult situations, how to manage conflict, do all the stuff that just, uh, well, CIPD research shows that the two things that managers find most difficult is having difficult conversations and dealing with conflict. And yes. yet most people, if they have conflict, it's with their manager. <laughs> <laughs> And so with one of my other hats on as a workplace mediator, um, that's a real challenge and equipping managers with those types of skills. And in fact, equip equipping anyone with the skill to be able mm. to have a, a disagreement constructively um, and ha hold to different uh, points of view and uh, debate with each other in a constructive way rather than getting into destructive conflict is a skill that I don't think we teach enough of. No, no. And, you know, it's a shame because these are life skills you're talking about, yeah. aren't you? They, they should be taught at school yeah. before people get into the workplace because yeah. young people are not equipped to deal with managers and managers necessarily are not just young people, but managers generally. There's, let's put it this way. I know from my own stepson who's mm. been who's been in numbers of jobs and he's n never apart from his last job which unfortunately he's been made redundant now because of covid but in his previous jobs the management skills he must have had at least four was just appalling how they treated him was just disgusting and he lost his cool with them you know and walked out and did all sorts yeah but the management style was just appalling when you, I mean, one of them I even got in touch with um, in, a, in like a pub mm -hmm. um, and, you know, went to have a meeting with the guy, not the manager, but with his manager. Yeah. And he was so grateful that I took the time out because he said, well, we'll make sure he'll, he's going to get some training and this, that and the other, you know. Mm -hmm. And fine, he was working in the kitchen, but the manager, how he treated him in the kitchen was just appalling, you yeah. know. Yeah. But again, it's a, like a chef. Yeah, it's quite prevalent. Mentality. I understand in the hospitality industry, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway. OK, mm. so HR manager. Oh, it's a yes. <laughs> as you can see, I am quite passionate about the topic. Yeah. I like to think that I was a, I don't have people I need to manage today. Mm. Well, apart from kind of suppliers and customers, <laughs> yeah. but we always have to manage somebody. But I'm, I was always very, very passionate about, you know, good management mm. management in organizations that mm -hmm. I've worked in. And I've seen some awful stuff I really have. Yeah. Um, but anyway. we, learn as, we learn as much from the people that are pure role models as we do from the people that are good role models as well. They're <laughs> gifts. Yeah. hundred percent. They are gifts. Yeah. Mm. I always used to say they are showing me how not to do exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so I can become a better manager and not copy what he's doing or she's doing. Yeah. Um, they generally were he's, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Gillian. So. So you moved to um, out of banking. Out of banking, and I went to work for Centrica, 
um, in the utilities and oil and gas. Yes. yes. Um, so I was group head of talent there. So I looked after all the wow. ta talent management globally. Um, so our senior population, um, at succession planning, development, etc. For them. Amazing. Mm, yeah. So that was that was a really exciting role because mm. it was out of what was a really challenging time in industry at the time, and it was a brand new role. So I had the opportunity to to shape that um and to kind of to really make it my own so really enjoyed enjoyed that role and, and learned a huge amount um, Brilliant. and obviously that was a new industry for me at the time as well so learned a lot about and that. where was that where was it located i was based at the head office in windsor oh again windsor. in the southeast yeah okay um yeah and uh i mean centrica was global as a company but yes yeah, yes 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 in, of course yes yeah mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, and I guess again, so that was moving into one of those center of expertise, center of excellence roles, having been in a business facing role. Um, mm. And the challenges around that are always, you have all these amazing ideas and things that you really want to do as an expert, but marrying that up with what the priorities are for the business is really important as well. So it's important not to kind of get so caught up in your shiny new idea that you want to implement and lose sight of what the business actually needs. So yes. that was kind of the key, um, I guess, uh, relationship there was our stakeholders in the, in the business and, and making sure that that worked. And also on the, the board and the, the executive board, because obviously they were interested and uh, very intimately involved with all the succession planning for the, for the senior team mm -hmm. and development of the senior team as well. Great. Sounds so, exciting. Yeah, I love that role. Um, and I moved from that role back then into a business facing HR role um, with a little pit stop to manage a big redundancy program in between. Uh, um, so I looked after HR for the customer service call centers um, or the contact centers around the UK. Um, for for Centrica still. Yeah, well, so in the British gas part arm of the business. Oh, great, yeah. got you, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so a number of call centres around the UK. So I had a team of uh, HR professionals working for me in the different contact centres. Okay, there. great. Um, and again, that was that was an interesting time because we just made a, a big tranche of redundancies. Um, mm. About, if I recall, it was about close to a third of the workforce at the time. Oh my word. Yeah. And so it was all about then, and it's going to be equally as important for organizations now, I think, is how do you rebuild trust and confidence um, and engagement in an organization when you've been through something difficult like that? Um, how, how do you give people that kind of hope almost? <laughs> I think that things are going to be okay in the future. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was the main focus of that role. That so, were you in 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 that last bit that you talked about is giving people hope? Yeah. So was that the role of HR or was that the role of the CEO? That, that was very much uh, owned by the business and and the leadership right. team in the business of which I was part as the um, as the head of HR for that area. Right. Right. Um, right. Right. And uh, yeah, so it was a, a business objective, which I got was you. Supporting. Yeah, so everybody um, had mm. to kind of yeah pull along on that journey. Because yeah, you're 100 percent right. That probably in all these organisations that I've been in was the hardest thing for management to achieve. Yeah, right, because. Um, I think you mentioned that key word, which was trust. Yeah. And how can you trust an organization when you know that the first tranche of redundancies is not going to be the last one? Mm. There's going to be more down the road. Yeah. Whereas you can't really say that up front mm. to spook people or you know, for them all to run out of the organization. Mm. And the same potentially will happen in organizations today where they'll need to do a tranche mm. to try and survive over the next six months. And then they may need to do another tranche. Yeah. And how I do you keep people optimistic and hopeful? Yeah. I think um, what's interesting, and if you look at different organizations, different approaches to these types of things, it's mm. interesting. But the ones that I think do it best 
are the ones who are as open and transparent as um, as possible with their people. Mm. So you're talking to the people right up front about here's what the financial situation is at the moment. Here's what's coming in. Here's what's going out. Here's what the impact of every single penny you can save has on the bottom line. And if you can get people really engaged in that, and um, certainly I saw, saw a couple of the oil companies trying to do that and seen it in other industries. If you can be really open with people and get them really connected to, like if we don't do anything differently, because that's always the risk, people just keep on doing the same old, same old, and then you don't save money and you do have to make redundancies. But if you can be open that, look, we, as a leadership team, we can see this thing coming. Mm. And at the moment, we're far enough away, if you think it's like the Titanic and the iceberg, we're far enough away from the iceberg that we could change course, but we need your help to do that. And if we don't yeah. manage to change course enough, then inevitably we'll have to make redundancies or, or what other options can you think of? So I remember in the financial crisis, um, I think it was KPMG offered people sabbaticals or four day weeks and things like that so that they could save money and, um, and people were able to take time off. And it meant that they had to make fewer redundancies during that time as a result of it. And I think if you engage the organization up front rather than just let it happen, then it builds that trust. It mm. builds that um, feeling that people are being listened to, their ideas are important, that, um, all that kind of stuff. And it puts you in a much better place for the future because hopefully mm. therefore you don't have to make so many redundancies. Yeah. Because obviously at the moment there's so much out of businesses control. There's all that uncertainty, which doesn't yes. help. We no. don't, nobody likes uncertainty. It makes us feel threatened. Um, and as individuals and business leaders have that as well. Mm. But the more you can do to connect with and share what you can with your team, then the better, I think. Mm. Mm. It's, it's really interesting because I, I remember distinctly, you know, when you say that kind of level of openness mm. and invitation for ideas and suggestions yeah. or, you know, it's a, it's a great way to do it. And because at the end of the day, people always think, well, it's them, yeah. the management and us, yeah. you know, the kind of workers. And I used to counsel some of the teams I used to mention and say, you know, you do realize that you're part of them as well, yeah. because it's actually, we're all one team. We're all in the organization together. Yeah. So you can't actually split out them and us because yeah. we're if all the organization in this... doesn't exist. Then none of us have roles. No, yet. that's right. There isn't, it doesn't actually, it's an incorrect statement to make. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore we need everyone, you know, to be thinking the same way because actually the senior management doesn't have all the answers no. and everybody always thinks that they do. It's a little bit like the government, you know, well, the government isn't doing this, they're not doing the other. And yeah, there's lots of criticism I can level at them. But actually, this is brand new for them too. They haven't got all the answers. Yeah. They are literally experimenting yeah. to see how they can fix things. And it's really hard. I mean, and we're getting into the realms here of some of the stuff I'm doing just now, but it's really mm -hmm. hard for leaders to feel comfortable displaying that level of vulnerability. Yes, yes. They, yeah. There's this expectation that's driven by years of, I think, command and control culture that the leadership have the answers or they should right. have the answers. That's mm. right. Yeah. Well, you, you're in a leadership position, so what, you should yeah. know the answer. Yeah. You, you tell know, me you... what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So after that, what happened next? After that, I had a baby. <laughs> Um, Congratulations. So, yes. Uh, he's now seven. So that's the kind of time frame we're in. Um, Brilliant. So when I, during that time, uh, my dad unfortunately became ill. So we moved up from uh, Windsor to mm. uh, Aberdeenshire, where I am now. Right. And I had the choice when I uh, finished my maternity leave whether to. Uh, go back and do the role that I was doing, which would be lots of travel around the, um, or, uh, around the country, which I didn't really fancy with a little one. No. Um, 
or to go back and do kind of like a full-time role and I, I'd thought about going out by myself for a while and mm. I figured if I don't do it now then I probably never will do it so that's right. when I set up my own business uh, in 2013. Brilliant. Wow mm-hmm. brilliant yeah and um, and so he was still a young baby when you did that he was yeah so uh just a, just a year old mm-hmm. yeah and i did that yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so and it worked out really well so it gave me a bit of flexibility i kind of came back gradually i just worked a few days a week to begin with and gradually built the business up from there um, but where did the idea come from a to to start your own business and to do what mm, um so i think there was always this desire i mean i'd always worked for large organizations diageo mars rbs edgeca um mm. and there was a bit that was around i want to try something completely different right. um there was a lot that is around i guess personal values i have around freedom and and things like that that's about mm. having that flexibility um to be able to be there for my son in the way that i want to be and yes. also have a fulfilling career Mm. Um, and certainly up until the point that I had him work was the big part of my life and I didn't want it to be that that way going on Um, and so I spent quite I was in the fortunate position that I didn't need to be earning a lot of money very quickly so I spent a bit of time uh, thinking about what I'd enjoyed during the previous roles that I'd had and and things like that and I trained to become a workplace mediator right so uh, going back to the conversation we were having earlier about conflict resolution skills and and that so i uh, my business initially and it's pivoted a few times since then but initially it Mm. was um, workplace mediation and conflict resolution skills for for managers and hr professionals because even as an hr professional it's something that you don't really get taught (laughs) how to deal with again you're just you're just expected to know how to deal with those difficult situations yeah um and so the first uh, year to 18 months, I say, I focused on that. Um, at that time, uh, we had the uh, oil and gas downturn, 2014, 2015. So there was a lot of redundancies going on in Aberdeen. And that was the time I worked with some of the organizations I mentioned earlier, worked with people that were going to be making redundancies to right. help them do it in an empathetic, caring way and to deal with some of their emotions and things like that that would inevitably come up mm. as a result of that. Mm. And I guess from there, the business has kind of evolved. So from conflict resolution, dealing with difficult conversations, and then much more broadly into into leadership generally. So uh, into uh, one-to-one coaching for more senior leaders. Right. Um, and typically these days, it's all it tends to be people that have gone through a similar transition to me. So coming from a technical engineering functional background into a leadership role. Um, right. And helping them with with those transitions right right um, and yeah. so i'm curious hmm. with all of the i know you did some specialist work in your kind of hr career yeah i would have expected you to say i set up an hr consultancy mm. It's funny, actually, so I have spent, and I do currently still have some clients that are HR consultancy clients, and I started, oh, okay. it's funny, you see that, so I actually, after about two years in doing business and just doing conflict resolution side, I found I was missing that business facing side, Right. Um, and so I started doing HR consultancy then, um, right. on top of the other stuff that I was doing, mm-hmm. and um but more recently, I'm focusing, I've, I've realized that what I'm really passionate about is supporting leaders um, that, are go, that have gone through that transition from technical expert to, uh, to leader, and particularly around, so I talk about, um, I see, so skill set is when you're an expert, you've got a real skill set, you know what you're doing. Yes. You've got your mindset then, which is around, I guess, your way of thinking, your drive, your ambition, your drive for results, etc. And mm-hmm. then what I call your heart set, which is much more your like purpose-led leadership, values-led, the empathy, the vulnerability, mm-hmm. all of that side of leadership. 
And so I actually writing a book at the moment that is around that to help people transition um, from head to heart <laughs> is what it's called. So for, for technical and functional experts that want to be more heart centered leaders. Brilliant. Sounds mm. amazing. Yeah. So, so you've created that kind of niche for yourself because yeah. it's also very close to you in terms of your journey. Yeah. So you've got a real kind of empathy and experience of that journey, Absolutely, doing that yeah. journey yourself, mm. which means people must have a high level of trust in you um, in terms of, well, you've, you've walked the path. Therefore, yeah. you're best qualified to give me some guidance on this journey as well. To a certain extent, yes, I would say. And um, although as a coach, what I find is it's much more about your listening skills and your um, ability to ask the great questions that really help people get to insight. Yeah. Um, and, it, and this is a, something that I talk a lot about to people in coaching, but generally to leaders is that so often when we're trying to build empathy, the best skill for building empathy is your ability to listen. Mm. And whilst lots of us may think we're really great listeners, actually what we're usually doing is just waiting for our chance to speak and thinking about what we want to say next. Hundred uh, percent. Or yeah, or we're thinking about that email that came in just before we got on the call that we really need to answer because it's really urgent. Or we're fact about the fact that our phones on the desk and the notifications are going off and we're wondering, oh, what is that? Um, <laughs> we're not actually focused and actively listening when we're with somebody, and mm -hmm. that is such a powerful skill, not just for coaches but for leaders generally in any role. Um, yeah. That ability. Yeah. And partly, I think, because we're also a bit scared of silence. So if you've not formulated what you're going to say next <laughs> in your head already, then inevitably there's going to be a bit of a silence. And again, getting comfortable with that, because if you're, if you're the leader having a one-to-one -one with one of your team and trying to develop them, the stuff that comes when you leave some silence is usually the most important stuff. Because it allows, well, Generally speaking, the person that you're listening to who's been speaking mm. will feel a bit uncomfortable with the silence and will try and fill it as well, potentially. Yeah. Um, and it gives them space to think as well. Yeah. So yeah. certainly for me, I'm quite an introvert naturally, and I'm a very reflective thinker. And you'll be able to tell that if, you, if we were having a conversation and I stopped speaking, if I'm off looking at the ceiling or to the side, it means I'm thinking and I'm going to say something else probably. <laughs> if I'm looking at you, then um, I'm probably ready for another question or another uh, direction in the, in the conversation. But right. having, having that skill as a leader is so, um, so helpful for your team's development, for your mm -hmm. ability to coach as a leader. I think if more leaders had this kind of coaching style, Yes. then it would make such a difference in all organizations and really help people thrive. And are you doing that with leaders inside organizations? So are you hired by organizations to do that with those taking them from skill set, mindset, heart set? Are you, are you going into organizations doing that or are you getting private clients coming to you asking for that? Um, it's a bit, a bit of a mix, I would say. So oh, I okay. have, yeah, so it's, it ten, ten, I would say generally it's an or, via an organization, but I work with business owners and, and CEOs um, of organizations, or it might be the HR director brings me in to work with one of their senior leadership team or things like that. Mm. So that's on the one-to-one -one side. Mm. Um, I'm also, I also do, um, so that would be like for a coaching program over a yes. number of number of months and then yes. also I'll do deep dives so say somebody's just got something that they just want to get really clear on um we can do a deep dive over two or three days for example and get right. like better as I really just want to get clear on my purpose or or something like that or my values and how I live and breathe them in the organization or, or something like that um or we've got the heart-centered leaders community which is the community that um, David and myself have just recently started. Yes, so that's the, 
is now a good time to talk about that so because I that's think, how yeah, I, probably that's kind of where we are now, the that's journey how I got, so far and now where we are yes mm -hmm. that's how i got to know about you yeah when i interviewed david for the podcast david yeah. Wynn. so anybody wants to listen to his episode please do so so you can hear the other side of the other it, the side other, of the journey yeah the other half and he's got a great story too mm. and um so how did the two of you meet and then how did this concept get developed yeah so we probably met i can't remember exactly when but it would have been three or four years ago in aberdeen at a, a networking event um and we uh we'd come across each other various times since then and, and kept in touch but really towards the end of last year um, David's career had taken a bit of a change so he'd moved into coaching um, and we got together towards the end of last year and um, realized we both really shared a passion for for what we call heart-centered leadership and and helping leaders mm. um, act and and live those kind of traits and values yeah. Um, and so we initially, our plan was to uh, to build a community, but a, a face to face one where we um, would have groups of people and we do group coaching and we go walk up a hill or something like that. Um, and then obviously <laughs> coronavirus hit and we could have just kind of said, oh, well, we'll maybe do that next year or something like that. But yeah. instead, what we had been doing was uh, a lot of research. So we've interviewed, we must be getting close to about 100 leaders now, I would say, um, about what's really important to them. And there are three themes that were coming through. So one is that leadership can be really lonely. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly if you're like an MD in a smaller medium business and you don't have a, um, a leadership team around you or, or things like that, it can be really lonely in terms of having somebody to share the challenges that you're going through with. Mm -hmm. Second was that leaders really crave in connection with other leaders and not necessarily in their own industry, but um, people that they can share similar challenges with, um, exchange experiences, um, get advice from and just almost that peer support group. Yeah. And then the third was that uh, it can be really hard to find time as a leader to make the time for your own development. Yes. Um, and uh, you often will be focused on developing your team and, uh, and things like that. But actually taking some time to focus on your own development mm, uh, can mm. be quite difficult. Yeah. And so we kind of evolved the idea of heart centered leaders into what it is now. And it's been running just over a month now um, where we have a, a community, a virtual community of leaders. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an online platform where we share resources, articles, uh, good podcasts, <laughs> things like <laughs> that um, with, the, with the community. Um, it's kind of, it's like a Facebook group, but without Facebook. <laughs> so you don't have that distraction. Um, and, uh, and we have a weekly call that members can join as many or as few of those weekly calls as they want to but mm -hmm. every week on a monday we have our call and uh, we'll share some tips and david and or i will um hot seat coach one of the community so they'll bring a challenge that they're facing at the moment or something that they want to explore and we'll coach them live on the call um, and what's really great about that is even if you're not the one being coached you can get so much insight from watching somebody else be coached and just thinking about how would that apply to me or, or what, yeah. might I do, what might my answer to that question be if like that so um it's still early days for the community but it's going great so far and how did the idea come about to to fill that space and do you think there is a gap to be able to you know a need for this i think so yeah so what i mean found... sorry yeah. sorry i guess it's because you're saying you interviewed so many yeah. leaders and that's how it's so yeah, I'm kind of answering my own question, <laughs> yeah. but even so, how do you know that this is the right formula? <laughs> yeah, uh, and the answer, to be completely honest, is we don't. Um, right. But what we're doing is uh, we're being very open with the community that particularly as founding members, this is their community and mm. we want to make sure that it's um, evolving and meeting the need that they have. So at the moment what it looks like is an online community and a call once a week if that's how it looks in a year i don't know because it will be shaped by the community to fit the needs that they have at whatever time 
Wow. I mean, it's good that you've got that kind of flexible thinking and will shape yeah. it around, you know, what the need is yeah. kind of this month, next month and how it evolves and changes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm pausing a little bit because I'm trying to think where else I, I guess it's a little bit like I maybe it's a bit like the, it's not the same format, but it's like the TEDx of, you're familiar with TEDx, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, you know, I think it's Chris Anderson. I mean, he developed that, you know, to get things in front of leaders, mm. um, very much about or allowing people to get people to back a new idea mm. and get behind somebody or behind the idea and in their community and stuff. I suppose that what you're doing is by starting the discussion around mm. the kind of heart centered leadership yeah. that it will start to become, you know, it's, it becomes like the central idea for doing this is a good idea. Yes. <laughs> Don't you all agree? So how can you all become better at doing it? And we're going to facilitate that journey for you, yeah. but you're going to do it. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, like I think, so I, I think I get what you, what you mean. I mean, I guess, so what, I mean, nobody, no leader, or certainly most leaders don't come to work wanting to be a bad leader, but True. they have never had the role models or they've never had the support. They, um, they may be an okay leader, but mm. the ones that really are brilliant. And if you think of them, they tend to be, and this is what we found from our research. They mm. tend to be the ones that can show vulnerability, do demonstrate empathy, do listen really well, do put the needs of their team before themselves, um, do walk the talk. Um, if they have values, they're not just a poster on the wall, but they're lived and breathed. <laughs> um, these are the leaders that people want to follow and that you will get out of bed and put in above and beyond effort because you want to do a good job for that leader. Mm. versus the one who's maybe much more of the stick approach <laughs> command and control where you'll grudgingly roll out of bed after pressing snooze three times and maybe call a sick day when you're not really feeling like it but you're probably not going to be working more than you have to to get things done because they're not motivating you engaging you showing any kind of care about mm. you mm. Mm. Her you know, we could have a whole podcast just talking about this topic because it fascinates <laughs> me immensely because mm. I see, I do actually witness a lot of bad leadership in the world. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, and um, you kind of makes you sometimes you lose heart, don't you? Literally using the word heart. You kind of go, God, there is no hope with some of the leaders that are running this world. You know, just look at them and look at what they're saying, the, the language they're using. And um, they have got none of some of the skills that you're talking about. No. And I guess that's um, so that our purpose for heart centered leaders um, that David and I have. It's around we are empowering generations of heart centered humans to make right. the world better. And right. we're starting with leaders because leaders, they're not just leaders in their organizations, they are also in their communities. They might be on the mm. parent council at school, they might be on some kind of local community group, but they're leaders in their communities. They're in their families as well. They're bringing up children, hopefully, yes. to have these <laughs> values as well. So mm. by starting with leaders, we're hoping for this ripple effect <laughs> um, to, to create, to help build the generations of humans humanity that is much more heart-centered and at the moment it's it's the two of you yep. so i'm going to be asking maybe we haven't rehearsed this in case anybody's <laughs> thinking this right it's going to ask a maybe a tricky question that yeah. is do you see this rolling out potentially around the world or mm. franchised in some way or yeah, I don't know what, but certainly David and I have big aspirations to scale it. Um, what exactly that would look like, not sure yet, but right. um, that would be a nice problem to have when we get to that point. Yeah. 
sound that I mean certainly that's what's needed isn't it I mean yeah. it's not something I've come across recently I'm not suggesting there are not other people doing it but the the thing is there there is you know especially at this time mm. there's a massive need for it more so of a need than ever I think yeah. I applaud you <laughs> too and I I think you're doing an amazing job with trying to spearhead this uh, I, I really do wish you all the success with it thank you i hope it's going to be what well, i know it's going to be really successful so well done yeah. and so and i know we're getting up to the end of the podcast we are doesn't time, time fly when it you're does, having a great conversation <laughs> but before you go could you mm. share with the audience a little bit about not a little bit but tell us precisely about where they can find you because I'm sure there are leaders out there that want yeah. to speak to you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my own website is fearlessedge.com, all one word, fearlessedge.com. And they can reach me at Gillian with a G at fearlessedge.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Gillian Thompson. Uh, and then the Heart Centered Leaders community, our website is heartcenteredleaders.co. Theo, and it's centered spelt the British way with an R E rather than yeah. an E R. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Brilliant. Anywhere else? Twitter? Uh, not on Twitter. No. So not LinkedIn on Twitter. Um, and Instagram. LinkedIn and Instagram. And Instagram. Okay. Yeah. And what, what you personally, or is it fearless edge or what? Uh, on Instagram, we've got, I've got fearless dot edge is my Instagram handle okay. and on LinkedIn, me personally, or either of the businesses, Fearless Edge and Heart Centered Leaders are both on there, as is David as well, who I'm sure would love you to connect with him too, if you're listening. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And last question, um, if you had a wish where you could, you know, get, which leaders would you love to attract to your new project? Oh, that's a good question. So I think it's those leaders that um, recognize there's a different way to lead and they want to lead a different way, but they're not sure how to. And they, they want to focus on becoming much more of that heart-centered leaders and really engage and build trust in their teams as we get through whatever the next few months and years brings for all of us. Fantastic. That sounds like a really good target. Yeah. And if I come across any, I'll send them your way. Amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. Gillian, thank you so much for your time. Really great to hear your story. I wish you all the success. And if you ever come down south again around Birmingham area, do let me know. Um, whenever we're allowed to kind of meet people, <laughs> you know six level down yeah <laughs> out in the open in the park whatever um it'd be lovely to meet in person and and thank you Definitely. so much for your time thank you for sharing thank you for having me it's been a pleasure take care all the best you too bye 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 staying alive uk share your story 